If you had to complete a series of three deadly trials to get revenge for someone you love, what would you do? There's new contestants on the chopping block, but this time, there's more to winning than just survival. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the death maze of revenge in Saw 3. <laughs> Jigsaw wants to play another game, but his new apprentice is about to break all of the rules. After failing his game, Eric Matthews suddenly wakes up on the floor in the middle of a pitch dark room, with nothing but a flashlight and his service weapon lying just out of arm's reach. As he tries to grab them, he realizes that he isn't able to move, so he takes off his shoe and uses it to pull the weapon closer. Unfortunately, the magazine is empty. Throwing it aside, he manages to get a hold of the flashlight instead dead, only to find out that his ankle is chained to a nearby pipe. The detective's first instinct is to start kicking as hard as he can, but no matter how hard he struggles, the pipe itself won't budge, which is when he notices a rusty hacksaw that was clearly left there for him to find. Grabbing it, he desperately begins trying to saw through the chain, but quickly realizes that it's no use, leaving him with only one other option. Across the room, he spots the chained up severed foot of one of the previous victims and suddenly understands what Jigsaw wants him to do. Nervous, he holds the saw up to his ankle and prepares to get to work, but can't bring himself to do it. So he grabs the cover from the back of a toilet and slams it down on his foot as hard as he can, until he's finally able to completely snap his ankle, giving him the leverage that he needs to slip out of the cuff. Okay, this guy just gave snapping out of it a whole new meaning. It's hard to argue with the results here, but with that being said, his escape strategy could use a bit of work. For fans of the Saw films, this trap should be painfully familiar, but would you really need to sacrifice a foot to escape? The truth is that Eric here gave up on sawing through the chain way too quickly. Just because some other dummy got desperate and decided to cut his own foot off doesn't mean that he should have immediately jumped to that same conclusion. All he needed to do here was hold the chain steady, lean into the cut with his body weight, and eventually keep working it until eventually he got through. Without water, he'd still have a good three days to survive down there, and even longer if he could find some type of water source like condensation from the nearby pipes, but without a foot, he'd likely die from blood loss in as quickly as three minutes if he didn't get some immediate medical attention. This is actually one of the few traps in the series that can be beaten without taking a serious injury, but unfortunately, the next players in Jigsaw's game aren't going to be so lucky. Of course we know from the last movie that the only reason Eric was in a major rush here was because he was trying to save his kidnapped son. But for anyone else, there'd be no immediate danger besides eventually dying of dehydration which gives you plenty of time to think up an exit strategy that doesn't involve any on-the-spot amputations. Plus, the longer that he's down there, the more time there is for help to arrive. There's no way to know if anyone's coming, of course, but it sure would suck to go through all of the trouble of sawing off a foot or even smashing your own ankle only to find out that rescue was on the way. When considering all of the possibilities, the best thing to do here would be to keep trying to cut through the chain until you were absolutely sure that it wasn't going to work. Now, let's say that this saw was too dull to cut through. This is when the toilet tank lid becomes the next best solution. Before turning it on his foot, it might have been smarter to try striking at the pipe that he was kicking when he first woke up hitting the chain where it connected to either the pipe or his ankle cuff, or seeing if he could damage the cuff itself. Snapping his ankle definitely would have gotten the job done, but if it were me, I'd only want to resort to that after I tried every other possibility. Several months later, a team of police officers uses a torch to slice their way through a sealed metal door into an abandoned classroom where they find another one of the maniac's recent victims. Detective Allison Carey quickly arrives on the scene, nervous that it might be Eric, but finding out that it isn't him doesn't make what she's seeing any less shocking. Scattered around the room are pieces of what's left of a man who was held in place by chains before violently blown to bits. It turns out that the victim's name was Troy, and Jigsaw chose him because he had squandered the advantages that he was given in life. 
and instead chose to become a repeat criminal, spending most of his life in prison. He was chained to the floor and ceiling by several hooks piercing through the skin all over his body, and given only 90 seconds to set himself free before a makeshift bomb would explode. Desperate to escape, he began ripping out the chains, one after another, until only one left was hooked through his lower jaw. But for all his efforts, he was too slow and the bomb exploded, blowing him to pieces. That makes one victim down, with eight more to go. Carrie still can't get Eric off of her mind, but the other officers say that the most important thing to focus on right now is finding the killer. The team is confused at how Jigsaw could have rigged up this trap in the first place, since he was practically dead the last time that they saw him, which is when Carrie says that she doesn't think that it was him at all. She argues that, although his traps aren't exactly fair, he always leaves the victim a legitimate way to escape. But in this case, the door was sealed shut, meaning that even if Troy had gotten free in time, he would have died either way. Okay, this was just unfair. The game was specifically designed to be unwinnable, and Troy here was dead the instant that that bomb started to count down. The only chance that he could have possibly had at survival would have been to somehow neutralize the explosives and hope that someone eventually came along to break him out. Since his time was limited, he could have tried to tear out only the chains that were necessary to allow him to get close to the bomb. And then, after quickly observing the electronics, made his best best guess as to what wire he could tear out to hopefully disarm it. Whether he gets it right or not, if he just sits there and does nothing, then he's dead either way. So giving it a try and hoping for the best really couldn't make the situation much worse for him here. Alternatively, it seems like the explosive charge itself was relatively small, with most of the damage coming from the shrapnel inside of the jar. With this in mind, he could have tried placing the bomb inside one of the desks to hopefully contain and redirect direct some of the power from the explosion, or tossed the thing next to the doors or windows and taken cover behind one of the desks, and the explosion would open up an escape route. Unfortunately, there was really no clean way out of this one, and poor Troy here was pretty much doomed from the start. That night, while washing up back at her apartment, Carrie sees a vision of Eric reflected in the bathroom mirror. Still obsessing over the case, she sits on her bed watching the jigsaw tape surrounded by evidence files from previous investigations. Just then, she notices something strange. At the end of the tape, it cuts into a live feed, and somehow it seems to be coming from the closet in her own bedroom. Acting quickly, she grabs her handgun from her nightstand and fires four shots straight through the closet door before going to check it out. Suddenly, someone wearing a pig mask appears in the room standing right behind her and instantly knocks her out. When she finally wakes up, she realizes that she's been taken into an abandoned building and is now in the middle of one of Jigsaw's traps herself. From a screen on the other side of the room, the puppet explains that she's attached to a device that's hooked into her ribcage. The key to unlock this device is sitting at the bottom of a jar of acid that's dangling right in front of her, and she'll have only one minute to retrieve it before she's torn apart. Horrified, she slams her hand into the jar, screaming with pain as the acid dissolves her skin, but finally manages to grab the key. With her hands shaking, Carrie desperately opens the padlock, only to realize that it was all a trick. Just like the last trap, this is the one that she was never meant to escape. The real killer steps into the room, revealing themselves to Carrie just before the end, when suddenly the trap activates, tearing open Carrie's chest and brutally killing her. That makes two victims down, with seven more to go. Meanwhile, this ER doctor, Lynn, manages to save the life of a child who was gravely injured in a car accident, although her co-workers notice that lately she hasn't been herself. In truth, she's been struggling with problems in her family life, as well as a dependency on prescription medication. At the end of her shift, she goes to the locker room and gathers her things, only to discover that she's been locked inside. When no one answers her calls for help, she decides to try reaching someone on her cell phone. But suddenly, the pig mask wearing attacker lunges at her from the shadows, knocking her out and taking her away. Sometime later, she wakes up tied to a chair in the middle of a horrifying workshop and the kidnapper reveals herself to be Amanda Young, one of Jigsaw's former victims who survived her test and eventually became his apprentice. Wheeling her into the next room, Amanda brings Lynn face to face with John Kramer himself. 
He explains that her hospital was where he received his fatal diagnosis, and calls her out for not appreciating the advantages that she was given in life, before telling her that he wants to play a game. That's when Amanda straps a metal collar around her neck that's holding five shotgun shells pointed straight at her head. The collar is linked to John's heart rate monitor, and if he dies or she tries to go out of range, it will trigger the shells, killing her instantly. Somewhere else, another victim is about to go through a series of tests. Amanda here has the only key, and if Lynn can keep John alive until the other victim completes his tests, then she'll also be free to go. Okay, Lynn may be in a tough spot, but the sad truth is that she made capturing her way too easy for Amanda here. Right up until they actually put the collar on her, Lynn wasn't in any immediate danger. Plus, they clearly need her alive to take care of John, so they might not have been willing to outright kill her if she had at least tried to fight back. As soon as she woke up, before even figuring out where she was or what was going on, the first thing that Lynn should have done was immediately start trying to set herself free. Since the only thing holding her in place were a few loosely tied ropes, if it were me, I would have quickly began moving my wrists back and forth to try and create enough space to slip my hands out, and then waited for the opportunity to start fighting back with everything that I had. Once they put that collar on her neck, it was pretty much game over, so the key would have been to try to put the beat down on Amanda here before she even had the chance to lock her in. Since John's on the brink of death, he wouldn't have been able to help his friend once the tussle started, so she's never gonna get a better chance to make her play than she had right when she first woke up. Is it risky? Absolutely, but personally, I'd rather go down fighting now than wait to see whatever else these freaks have in store. Meanwhile, Lynn's estranged husband, Jeff, wakes up trapped in a wooden crate somewhere in an abandoned meatpacking plant. Looking around, he finds a tape player in there with him, and Jigsaw explains that he's been chosen because of his obsession with revenge against a drunk driver who killed his son and received only a short sentence. He's about to face several challenges offering him the chance to choose either revenge or forgiveness. With the final test being a confrontation with his son's killer if he can make it all the way through, throwing his body weight against the sides of the container, he finally manages to knock it down from the forklift where it was suspended, busting open the crate and setting himself free. Jeff has a flashback of him standing in his son's bedroom and preparing to confront the child's killer. After a few glasses of booze, he notices that one of the kid's stuffed animals is missing and storms into his daughter's room where he catches her sleeping with it. Furious, he tells her never to touch things from the boys' rooms again, showing that he's still extremely attached to his son's possessions. Back in the room, he returns the boy's shirt to the closet when suddenly, Amanda bursts out from behind it and kidnaps him. Back in the abandoned building, Jeff picks himself up and begins to look around. On a table nearby, he finds a note that reads, Open the door, Jeff, along with a picture of himself that's been torn out from a more complete photo, as well as a single small key. At the workshop, Amanda alternates between keeping track of Jeff's progress and watching Lynn work. The doctor starts off by running some tests to evaluate John's condition, and Amanda steps in to let him know that the game has begun. Trying to reason with her, Lynn says that they need to take John to the hospital if he's going to survive, but Amanda grabs her by the side of the head and explains that they brought her there for a reason. Going to the hospital isn't an option, but without the proper medication and equipment, Lynn argues that he'll never make it. That's when John speaks up, telling Amanda that the woman can't do her job if she continues threatening her, and reminding her to play by the rules. Suddenly, his heart rate spikes, and he begins to vomit as he slips into a full-blown seizure. Lynn immediately jumps into action, holding him still and shouting at Amanda to keep the oxygen mask over his face. Panicking, she searches the room for any seizure medication, but without it, there's nothing that they can do. Luckily, the seizure subsides and John's condition stabilizes. Although Amanda is clearly shaken up by the whole event, Lynn asks Amanda if she's ready to take him to the hospital yet, explaining that John needs an operation to relieve the pressure from his brain. She agrees to the procedure, but insists that they have to do it in the workshop, saying that she'll find Lynn wherever she needs to get it done. Okay, the situation might look bad for Lynn here, but what Amanda doesn't realize is this actually gives her a perfect opportunity to escape. 
With John on his deathbed, the only real threats in the room are Amanda herself and the trap collar that's locked around her neck. Since Amanda is holding the key, if Lynn can find a way to disable her and take it without setting off any alarms, then she'll pretty much be home free. As a part of the materials that she's about to order, Lynn should request several doses of highly potent sedatives. To Amanda, this shouldn't come off as suspicious, because for all she knows, they're an important part of the procedure. In reality, she'll be bringing Lynn everything that she needs to make her escape. With the sedatives all secured, all that Lynn would need to do is lure Amanda out of John's sight before finding an opportunity to hit her with a heavy dose to silently knock her unconscious, grab the key, and get the hell out of there before anyone knew what she was up to. Even if she's locked inside, with the collar off, there's nothing stopping her from grabbing one of the dozens of weapons that's lying around the place, taking out her two captors, and then having all of the time that she needs to come up with a way to get out. Searching through the building, Jeff eventually makes his way to a large freezer door marked with the words, Face Your Fears. Inside, he finds a woman hanging from a chain and the door immediately slams shut behind him. The woman wakes up and starts begging him to spare her life, barely able to get a word out due to the freezing cold. Jeff notices a padlock attached to the chains, but the key that he found isn't the right fit. He spots another lock on a door nearby, only to find out that his key doesn't match with that one either. And that's when he notices a tape player placed in the corner of the room. He listens as Jigsaw explains that this is going to be his first test. The woman in front of him was the only witness at the scene of his son's death but she was too self-absorbed to help out or testify against the killer. There is a key placed behind a stack of freezing cold pipes, which will unlock the door, and can also be used to free the woman if he chooses to forgive her. Suddenly, several hoses turn on, covering the woman with freezing cold water as she starts to scream in pain, before shutting it off again and giving them a chance to talk. Jeff only listens as the woman begs him to let her go. She explains that she didn't personally do anything to his son, but he argues that that's exactly why she deserves her fate. On the brink of death, the woman tearfully apologizes, saying that she's only human and made a mistake, which finally convinces Jeff to set her free. As the water turns back on, he wraps his arm in his shirt sleeve to protect himself from the cold pipes, but the key is hanging just out of reach. By now, the woman is completely frozen solid, but there's a chance that she might still be alive. Jeff leans as close as he can to the pipes, burning the side of his face on the cold metal. Finally, he grabs the key, although he loses some skin from his cheek. Rushing back over to the woman, he reaches up for the padlock, only to realize that it's completely frozen over, leaving him with no way to save her. That makes three victims down, with six more to go. Okay, if Jeff here was really going to save this woman, then he sure wasted a lot of time giving her the old cold shoulder. Going forward, he should make a general decision about whether he's going to save the victim or let them die, if for no other reason than to streamline the process. Now, there are some pros to letting Jigsaw's traps take their course here, one of which being that Jeff would get his long-awaited revenge, but also because it keeps things simple and removes the chance of the other person deciding to turn against him at some point later on. Personally though, I'd choose to save everyone that I could, since having a team of grateful allies could help out in the future tests, and more importantly, I'd have someone to use as a meat shield if things ended up taking a turn for the worse. To save the woman's life, the first thing that Jeff should have done was to grab onto the water hoses and use his body weight to try and rip them down one at a time. They don't look very strong, and if he could manage to disable them, then that would buy him some more time to reach the key and unlock her restraints. When it comes to going for the key itself, Jeff made a wise move by using his shirt sleeve to protect himself from the freezing pipes. What he failed to do, though, was think the scenario all the way through. Since the key was just out of reach, he ended up needing to get so close to the pipes that he burned some of the skin off of the side of his face. The thing is, he's actually wearing several layers of clothing, so by simply taking one of them off and using it to protect his face, he could have reached the key without causing himself any harm at all. Although he managed to get out, he's gonna have to start thinking more creatively if he wants to get through the next challenges clean and get the good ending. Out in the hallway, Jeff finds another note that reads, one bullet will end it all, along with a picture of his son cut out from the same larger photograph. 
And a single handgun round back at the workshop, Lynn starts looking around while Amanda is gone, trying to come up with a plan to escape. Just then, Amanda appears behind her, saying that she knows exactly what she was up to. Instead of retaliating, she simply hands Lynn an axe, giving her an open shot to kill her but explaining every reason why doing so would be a horrible idea. Lynn can only stand there while Amanda takes back the axe and tells her that she has what they'll need for John's operation. Going to his bedside, Amanda tearfully updates John on Jeff's progress, saying that he's made it past the first test. He's clearly not doing well and tells her that there's some things that he needs her to do, explaining that she'll find an envelope with her instructions in the middle drawer of his desk. With the procedure about to begin, Amanda admits that she's terrified of losing him, but he reassures her that everything is going according to plan. Meanwhile, Jeff rounds the corner into a hallway where he finds a recreation of the scene of his son's death. The puppet laughs at him when he picks it up, making him extremely angry, and he sees another door ahead marked with the words, time to let go. Pushing his way inside, he accidentally activates the trap, and the door slams shut behind him once again. Just then, he hears a man calling out for help somewhere in the room. Climbing a ladder to the second level, he finds another tape player hanging from a chain, and the man in question at the bottom of a huge vat. He's looking at Judge Halden, the man who let his son's killer off with an incredibly light sentence. The key for the exit and to set the judge free is hidden somewhere within his son's possessions, but to find it, he'll have to make the decision to incinerate them all. The machinery in the room powers on, and the conveyor belt carrying rotten bodies of dead pigs begins dropping them into the meat grinder, with their liquefied guts being funneled into the vat, threatening to drown the judge in the revolting ooze. Jeff slowly thinks over his decision asking the judge if he remembers what he did. The judge pleads with Jeff to save him and not to become a killer himself, adding that he has a son as well. Okay, Jeff here needs to act quickly before he loses another perfectly good meat shield to Jigsaw's trap. The pros and cons to saving the judge or letting him die are the same as the last test. So if it were me, I'd try to spare the man's life, but he's going to need to act fast. When Jeff entered the room, he accidentally pulled a pin out of the machine's control panel, which seems to have activated the trap. That pin should still be hanging near the wall attached to the wire. So the first thing that I'd try would be to see if I could get a hold of it and return it back to its original place, hopefully shutting down the conveyor. If that didn't work, then he could just try the brute force method of destroying the control panel itself to shut down the machine that way, or finding something like a metal rod to jam into the gears and bring it to a stop. Now, when it comes to the incinerator full of his son's things, it seems like the door is only secured with a padlock, meaning that if he could strike it hard enough with any blunt object that he could find, then he could probably force his way inside without having to turn on the flames. He'd still have to figure out exactly which of the kid's items the key was hidden in though, and might end up needing to destroy them in the process anyway. As it stands right now, the smartest decision would be to just close his eyes and quickly flip on the incinerator without allowing himself to overthink it. Unless he wants to be stuck there revengeless forever, he's gonna have to find that key to get out of the room regardless of what happens to the judge. So it's best to just get it over with as quickly as possible. That way he can hopefully save the man in time and have a potentially helpful ally, while also bringing himself that much closer to freedom and his son's killer. Taking his time, Jeff makes his way to the incinerator, but he can't bring himself to destroy the only physical connections that he has left to his son. Eventually, the judge stops screaming. Jeff reluctantly activates the incinerator and watches as his son's things are turned to ashes before his very eyes. The key falls out and he rushes back to the vat, where he finds the judge only seconds away from drowning in the guts. Jeff unlocks the chain and pulls him up just in time. Back at the workshop, Lynn prepares everything that she'll need for John's operation and Amanda shows up to give him another update on Jeff's progress. Lynn explains that she has to cut away a part of John's skull to relieve the pressure on his brain. Although she can give him local anesthesia to help numb the pain, he'll have to remain fully alert through the duration of the procedure. 
First, she uses a scalpel to slice open and peel back the skin from the area, revealing the surface of his skull, and she tells John to keep his mouth closed, while she fires up a power drill and makes four holes in the bone. Lynn then picks up a circular saw and carefully cuts out a section of his skull one side at a time. Finally, the procedure is complete, but suddenly, John's heart rate begins to drop. Lynn does whatever she can to keep him alive, and Amanda goes into full-blown panic mode. Luckily, he manages to stabilize, but as he's coming to, he grabs Lynn's arm and tells her that he loves her, causing Amanda to storm out of the room. While Lynn's cleaning up after the surgery, Amanda comes in and gives old Johnny a big hug. Lynn chimes in that, since he's still in shock, John can't hear her. Furious, Amanda grabs her by the throat and is about to draw a pistol when suddenly John wakes up, ordering his minion to let the doctor go and telling her to leave the room. Once she's gone, he apologizes to Lynn for her behavior. Outside, Amanda has a flashback to the aftermath of the first game that she helped Jigsaw set up. One of the victims, a man named Adam, had survived the trial, but was left to die from his wounds in a dilapidated bathroom. Feeling guilty, Amanda returned to the room and promised to free him, although what she really meant was suffocating him to death with a plastic bag. This made her a murderer, which is strictly against Jigsaw's code. Meanwhile, Jeff and the judge arrive outside the door to the third stage of his test, which is marked with the words, here's your chance. On a table nearby, he finds a note reading one step closer to your revenge, along with a handgun magazine and a torn out picture of his daughter. The judge apologizes for what happened to his son, but also argues that vengeance won't solve anything. Still, Jeff kicks through the door, activating the final trap. Inside the room, he finds a man hooked up to a cross-like torture device with a tape player hanging from his neck. The man before him is the driver who struck and killed his son, and now's his chance to finally take his revenge, or forgive the man and set him free. The device is going to slowly twist his arms, feet, and neck, tearing him apart one limb at a time. Unless Jeff retrieves a key that's placed at the end of a long glass box and tied to the trigger of a double-barreled shotgun. As soon as the tape is finished, the door that they come through slams shut and a timer begins to count down from one minute as the machine jolts to life. Jeff only stands there and watches as the man's right arm is twisted until the bone snaps and tears through his skin. Trying to save him, the judge goes for the key himself but is too afraid to grab it. The man's left arm is next, snapping in the same way, but as his feet begins to twist, Jeff finally decides to spare his life. Moving over to the box, he quickly observes how it's set up before reaching in and pulling the key towards him as far as he can. Carefully, Jeff unlatches the hook and takes the key, but the moment that he lets go, the shotgun fires, tearing off the side of the judge's face and killing him. With only seconds left, he goes back over to the trap but can't manage to find the place for the key in time, and the device snaps the man's neck while Jeff can't do anything else but watch. That makes five victims down with four more to go. Okay, it looked like Jeff finally got what he wanted, but the revenge wasn't so sweet after all. You see, so far he ended up trying to save both of the previous victims after taking some time to think it over. So if he knew in his heart that he would do the same even for his son's killer, then he really should have acted more quickly to get the key and rescue him. I mean, what's the point of waiting until the guy's arms and legs were completely broken and he was bleeding to death before springing into action? With that much damage done, he's essentially just a liability that Jeff would need to take care of while he was still trying to find his way out. If he was just gonna let him die, then just let him die. Don't wait until the last possible second before deciding to set him free. The way that he got the key from the trap was almost perfect, but once he realized that pulling the key towards him would put pressure on the trigger of the shotgun, he should have made sure that no one was in the line of fire before letting go. After all, I would have hated to have to go through all the trouble of saving the judge the first time around only for him to be turned into Two-Face this close to the finish line. While Amanda watches this unfold from the cameras, John begins to ask Lynn questions about her personal life explaining that it's in her best interest to keep him talking. She confesses that things haven't been going well with her husband, although now she says that she'd give anything to see him again. 
but John calls her out for playing a part in the failing relationship and not being there for her children. Grabbing his hand, Lynn begs him to let her go. Just then, Amanda walks in to give them a progress update, but John only tells her to beat it. Heartbroken, she goes into the next room and grabs a handgun before returning to John's bedside and telling him that Jeff has completed the third test. According to John, this means that Lynn is free to go, but Amanda refuses to remove the collar and honor her end of the deal. That's when he confronts her with the knowledge that she's been secretly killing off survivors of the game, including Eric who had her falsely imprisoned and essentially caused the downward spiral that her life became. It turns out that Eric had managed to free himself before she left the abandoned building where he was being held. After hearing him coming down the hallway, Amanda first decided to hide and let him go, but he quickly discovered her and attacked her with a metal pipe. During the scuffle, she managed to kick Eric in his injured ankle, causing him to become stunned with pain and giving her a chance to escape. However, as she was walking away, he began mocking her, and in her rage, she turned back to finish the job. Although this broke the rules, John still chose to forgive her, giving her one final chance to prove that she could be his successor. Confused, she asks why this woman is so important to him, but John responds that she isn't important to him at all. However, she is incredibly important to Amanda herself adding that this is her last chance to get things right. As he makes his way through the building, Jeff finds a final note with the words last chance and the matching handgun for the magazine and bullet that he picked up along the journey. Jeff steps into the workshop and calls out for his wife, but as she runs to him, Amanda fires a single shot into her back. Furious, Jeff raises his pistol and uses his only bullet to shoot Amanda in the neck. As she collapses to the floor, bleeding to death, John reveals that the test had actually been Amanda's all along. Because her games were unwinnable, her test subjects were really nothing more than murder victims. And so, he decided to give her one more opportunity to prove that she could play by the rules. While setting up this test, he deliberately left her in the dark about the couple's backstory, hoping that she'd do the right thing and set Lynn free when she won the game, which she ended up failing to do. Now, her game is finished, and Amanda falls to the ground, dead. That makes six victims down, with three more to go. Jeff raises his gun and points it at John, but the man argues that no amount of revenge will make things right. Laughing, he pulls the trigger, but the weapon is empty, and so he turns his attention back to his wife. John explains that he can have an ambulance arrive in four minutes to save the woman's life, but the only way that Jeff can help her is to resist his desire for revenge and forgive him. Jeff approaches his bedside and says that he forgives him, but suddenly raises a circular saw, using it to slit John's throat. Okay, these idiots both just made the worst possible decisions. When it comes to Jigsaw, his games may be twisted, but there's always a way to win if you just follow the damn rules. Well, it looks like these two are just the latest in a long line of degenerates who've had to learn this lesson the hard way. Amanda and Jeff, you f***ed up. Let's start with you first, Amanda. As Jigsaw's evil apprentice, you should have known better than anyone else how this was all supposed to work. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but back in that abandoned house with the needle pit a few months ago, were you not the one constantly reminding all of the other hostages that they'd only survive if you just play by the rules? Well, here you are, a bit older, but apparently none the wiser, thinking that you can take matters into your own hands and just run amok without facing any consequences. If there was one person who was guaranteed to catch on to what you were doing, it was John here. And when he did, how did you think that he was going to react? Killing your victims without ever giving them a chance to redeem themselves goes directly against everything that he stands for. So of course he was going to come up with some convoluted scheme to give you one last shot at redemption. Unfortunately for everyone involved, it looks like you failed miserably, and the worst part is that you're not alone. Which brings us to you, Jeff. Talk about making the absolute worst decision possible right when it mattered the most. I mean, seriously, man, just read the room. Your wife's just been shot in the back, and John here is telling you that he can have an ambulance on the way to save her life if only you'd spare his own. That's not to mention the horrifying death device that's still strapped around her neck. 
If anything else, it might be a wise decision to at least ask him what's up with that before making any rash decisions. Plus, every test so far has centered around the theme of forgiveness. And when you've failed to let things go, someone died. Looking around the room, your wife is clearly the only person left who could suffer if you make the wrong decision here. So chances are pretty damn high that failing this last test will result in her losing her life. This is what you call a no-brainer. You should have listened to John and just forgave him. But you blew it right at the very end, and you're about to find out that even in death, Jigsaw still has a few tricks up his sleeve. In an instant, the door to the room slams shut, trapping him inside, while John's heart rate monitor flatlines, activating the collar around Lynn's neck and blowing her head to pieces. That makes eight victims down, with one survivor, but the game isn't over yet. With his dying breath, John activates a tape player, explaining to Jeff he was his final test, and by killing him, he failed. While Jeff was trapped, John captured his daughter and was the only person who knew where he could find her. The girl is trapped somewhere with only a limited amount of air to survive. And if Jeff wants to find her before it's too late, you guessed it, he'll have to play another game. But what would you do if you woke up in Jigsaw's super secret lair with a shotgun shell necklace strapped to your head? Would you whimper and do everything he says? Or would you ask him where the hell he's getting all these Ziploc bags, these little tiny tapes, and these little tiny tape recorders? Or is that just me? Leave a like and subscribe and let us know down in the comments what you would do in this situation. Also check out the How To Be playlist for more videos just like this. Also be sure to check out that new Kill Plan show that just dropped on the channel. It's Fire Flames. And uh, have a damn good day.